are some important things to keep in mind in, say, the second month of linear progression as a novice? Um, after the first month kind of settled in, six, eight weeks in, what are the critical kind of questions to ask or things to make sure are on point to take you through the next six weeks of that yeah. or so? Good question. I think where most people get themselves in trouble with the linear progression is the fixation on just simply adding weight to the bar. You need to be improving as a lifter. Some of these little things that we're addressing and everybody had them today and you'll consistently have them, you need to get that stuff worked on. And that's not to tout our own, to our own horns about coaching, but the importance of real-time feedback as a novice is critical. And without it, you have to find a way to Online coaching is a valuable thing, and coaching is a valuable thing. Um, I do a fair amount of one-off sessions, and a lot of times I unfortunately never see the person again. Occasionally, they'll come back and they'll be stronger, and they'll be a pretty similar set of challenges they've run themselves into. And it's often because they were able to get the low-hanging fruit by just showing up and adding weight to the bar. Yeah. But eventually, yeah. you know, it's yeah. 250, 300. It kind of depends on the size of the lifter. And, the, but if you and then all the form errors start to really pay off. The chickens come home to roost, all the neglect of, of the proper form and the tightness and all that yeah. stuff. That's when it all comes back to roost. Yep, yep. Back issues, things yeah. are bothering, yeah. they're missing weights. And, and the technique is important. That's why we do these kind of things, and that's why we encourage getting some kind of coaching through the process. And you need to improve as a lifter session to session. And I think a lot of people just worry simply on how quickly can I get to heavy weight. And that's not the way to go. And I think most of you guys are pretty sensible. You understand that. And that's why you're here. So that's good. Success in training is largely doing shit right when you're in the gym and doing shit right when you're out of the gym. And make sure your recovery variables are in line. Take your nutrition seriously as much as you can control stress and get good rest. And then just ride it out, man. Just keep showing up and doing it and it will start getting hard. I think my experience has been most male lifters at somewhere between 185 and 225 kind of hit a hiccup where either a little bit of a reset needs to happen or I kind of got to take them to the, into the corner, kind of shake them up a little bit and say, hey, you got to clean this up. I think there comes a point where you unrack a heavy enough weight and you're like, oh, okay, this is some work. I mean, it, yep, yep. it kind of depends on the lifter. But um, you got to clean up the technique and you got to learn to start grinding a little bit and you got to just keep moving forward. I mean, it's simple as that. But the technique is the thing that's important that you get your control. It's like, we're, we're, you know, on Barbell Logic, if you guys aren't subscribed to Barbell Logic, you need to be. Where Reynolds often says, it's like, yeah, you don't need a new program. You just need better technique. You know, yeah. you're, you're stuck because, you know, because your technique uh, sucks. And um, so, first of all, implicit in your question is, the the idea the unspoken idea that um the second month of novice progression is the same for everybody and it's not right so your second month of lp may look different from my second month of lp and will look different from you know mike's second month of lp and so on so um there's a lot of individual factors that come into play in lp um the second thing is to to chris's answer um I, and I've, I've thought about this a lot lately. It sounds very self-serving for us as coaches to sit up here and say, well, you know, you should have a coach. Everyone should have a coach. But it really is true. Everyone should have a coach, right? Now, does that mean that it needs to be a starting strength coach? Ideally, yes, right? I, and I have to say that in all good conscience. For me to say anything else just to appear sort of like neutral about it would be dishonest, right? Um, we know this system and we know how to coach this system, right? And so you're not going to find anybody else who coaches this system. You've all committed to this system of training. You're not going to find anybody who knows how to coach this system of training better than a starting strength coach. So it, ideally a starting strength coach. If not a starting strength coach, then a starting strength online coach. But let's say you can't afford a starting strength coach or even a starting strength online coach. You should at least have the coach in your back pocket right mr cell phone you should be taking video right and critiquing yourself as well as you can actually there's another alternative in between those right you should have a lifting partner somebody who like you is committed to reading the foundational text committed to the system they're not going to make shit up they're not going to be some sort of snowflake kind of guy right 
who's going to add weird shit to the program or take stuff away from the program. Somebody who's committed to doing the program with you, right? And learning how to eyeball the lifts and learning how to coach you and give you cues onto the bar. And you'll make mistakes. You'll <coughs> both make mistakes. But having eyes on you or at least a camera on you is better than just lifting by yourself. And I know this as well as anybody because for a long time I was like, I don't need a coach. I'm doing just fine. I'd look at my videos. Hey, I'm doing fine, right? This knee thing forced me. It forced me finally to get a coach. And I went crying to Will Morris and he's like, yeah, I'll coach you. He found all kinds of shit, right? All of us. We all do weird shit given enough time. We all have form creep. We all start to develop <laughs> bad habits, right? Dr. Steph Bradford um, has talked a lot about the coach lifter interaction. And so increasingly, I'm convinced that the coach and the lifter form a complete, comprehensive, cybernetic feedback loop and she's I mean she's done some really heavy thinking about this too and so is uh, Nicholas Solon yep. he's, he's, he's thought and written a lot about that too yep. right that is a complete system having eyes on you right closes the loop right and you it, it's a very very powerful system so in a way when you're lifting on your own lifting on your own you know, is to strength training as, I don't know, or, or TV dinners are to, you know, great cuisine. It's just not the same thing. It's not a complete system, right? So there needs to be eyes on you. And if there's nothing else, you you know, we, we had a couple of people here today who've been lifting on their own. I'm like, are you using video? No. Well, how do you know that you're getting to depth? How do you know that you're driving your knees out? How do you know that your back is straight, right? You've got to have some kind of feedback, right? And mirrors are not it. So that is the complete system. So um, we strayed a little bit from your question, but it gave us an opportunity yeah, to talk good. about some, you know, some important stuff. It's form, it's recovery. The short answer to your question is, what do you worry about during your second month of LP? The same stuff you should be worrying about during your first month of LP and your third month of LP, and also your 50th month of intermediate training. The same stuff. Form, consistency, recovery, all of it. It's all the little shit that's got to be it's worked all out. all the little stuff. Sir? Great seminar today, guys. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Uh, thanks couple quick things. Um, so I'm kind of like a lot of guys my age. I've, I've been on this random walk of strength training. But we all run into starting strength. And then I bought your book, uh, Barbell Prescription. Best thing I ever did was my Thank you. So when you look back to the book where it's at today, is there anything you could change within the book itself or any new thoughts on that? Good question. Thanks. And then I just got a quick, quick segment. But it was Chris addressed it. It was about the press. Okay. Uh, the the book, the barbell prescription. There were a couple of things um, that um, we could not include for reasons of length. I would like to expand the section on nutrition a little bit. Uh, I would like to. Um, I'm pretty happy with part one. Eventually, I would like to go in and update the references and cite any literature and any progress that we've made in our scientific understanding of the aging process. Um, you know, the biology of aging is moving forward by leaps and bounds. Although, I don't think there's anything that we're seeing in the biology of aging that's going to change the prescription. We did have an appendix that I wrote on relative and absolute contraindications to lifting. That was left out for reasons of length and also concerns about liability. I would like to have seen that included. Um, I think I think that um, the programming section I is pretty brilliant. Um, I think that um, maybe uh, a little bit of expansion of the programming system uh, of the programming section uh, with the inclusion because both Andy and I have continued to learn things since you know just in the last few years since the book was finished. 
Uh, we've continued to learn. Um, Andy is just, you know, he's a programming genius, so I'm sure he would have stuff to add to it. I'm very proud of the book. I'm very happy with it. Uh, I think it still does what it's supposed to do. Uh, and I think it, I don't think there's anything else like it anywhere in the literature, anywhere in the world. Uh, eventually, we'll, we'll want to revise it and make it better. But I have to say, we churned the manuscript in uh, about four or five months before it appeared in print. And um, you know, I had I had never I I published uh, scientific papers and you know book chapters and stuff like that before, but I'd never worked with a commercial publisher. And um, so um, that was apparent from the from the way that I submitted the manuscript, and they let me know about it. And uh, Asgard, they are perfectionists, and. Um, so uh, there was some, you know, there was, there was some, some grumbling and the biting and the scratching and the gnashing of the teeth and the pulling of the hair and all that. And, it was, you know, it was a little bit of a frustrating process getting it from submission to print. And on the day that I first held the book in my hands, I saw why all that was. It, I, I almost wept. It was so, it was such a beautiful book. You know, I'm not talking about the content. I'm talking about the book itself. Um, and uh, it was hard to believe that Andy and I had produced something that had become this incredibly beautiful text with the way the way it's laid out. Um, and uh, and the Kindle version too. I mean, the Kindle version you can go and you know we'll cite a reference and you can go right to that reference in the index and then you can go right back to where you were. It's beautifully laid out. So Asgard and Dr. Bradford. Simply amazing. So I, I couldn't be prouder of it. And you had a follow up question? I was just going to say. What was the press thing? The, when you talk about just going strict press, you know, I got away from 1, 1 1.5, 2.0, went back to strict press. It cured a lot of my back. Yeah, and I, and, and I would go on record. I wouldn't necessarily say everybody needs to do that. There's different contexts, different trainees. But my experience has been if somebody's got lower back issues, try giving a really, really strict press a try, and it usually can be a big help. Wear your belt. And wear your belt. I love, <laughs> so I love Press 2.0. Uh, and uh, I've said before, I think that the Press 2.0 has more in common with the Olympic lifts than any of the other lifts. There's a real, there's a real power, com a real power signature to a power component. And and there, I have no doubt that for any given lifter, that person, if they can do it and they can tolerate it, is going to be able to lift more weight with 2.0 than they can with strict press. There's no doubt about no that. Question. You have any no. argument with that, no. right? That being said, there are people who don't tolerate the strict press or don't tolerate press 2.0, um, and then there are people who are, you know, I don't want to be unkind, but there are people who are just you know, challenged. You know, they're just not graceful. And there's a certain amount of grace and timing and coordination that goes into the press 2.0, right? And there's some people who's like, no matter what you do, they're going to come up on their toes, or no matter what they do, they're going to get into their knees, right? And it, you know, they'll never get the timing right. And it's like, hey, you know what? Strict press, yeah. just just press 1.0, and then and then a whole bunch of problems disappear, and they're able to make progress. And then maybe eventually you can get them back in the press 2.0. So I'm actually not. I'm actually not hesitant when I see somebody saying, you know what, maybe you should just strict press for a while. Yeah. And, and uh, I've, I actually solved a lot of problems that way. I, I, I have people do press 2.0 if they can, just like I have people clean if they can. But some people can't, so, and that's fine, that's fine. Um, as long as you can do the movement.